And now, the late book. In 1943, Primo Levi was arrested and deported to Auschwitz. His expertise as a chemist saved him from the gas chambers. The story of a carbon atom, an atom that mirrors each episode of its life in the course of an atmospheric journey through time, was, he says, his first literary dream that came to him in Auschwitz. Our character lies for hundreds of millions of years, bound to three atoms of oxygen and one of calcium, in the form of limestone. It already has a very long cosmic history behind it, but we shall ignore it. For it, time does not exist, or exists only in the form of sluggish variations in temperature, daily or seasonal. For the good fortune of this tale, its position is not too far from the Earth's surface. Its existence, whose monotony cannot be thought of without horror, is a pitiless alternation of hots and colds, that is, of oscillations a trifle more restricted and a trifle more ample, an imprisonment for this potentially living personage worthy of the Catholic hell. To it, until this moment, the present tense is suited, which is that of description, rather than the past tense, which is that of narration. It is congealed in an eternal present, barely scratched by the moderate quivers of thermal agitation. But precisely for the good fortune of the narrator, whose story could otherwise have come to an end, the limestone rock ledge, of which the atom forms a part, lies on the surface. It lies within reach of man and his pickaxe. I, the narrator, decide out of pure caprice to be the year 1840. A blow of the pickaxe detached it and sent it on its way to the lime kiln, plunging it into the world of things that change. It was roasted until it separated from the calcium, which remained, so to speak, with its feet on the ground, and went to meet a less brilliant destiny, which we shall not narrate. Still firmly clinging to two of its three former oxygen companions, it issued from the chimney and took the path of the air. Its story, which once was immobile, now turned tumultuous. It was caught by the wind, flung down on the earth, lifted ten kilometres high. It was breathed in by a falcon, descending into its precipitous lungs, but did not penetrate its rich blood and was expelled. It dissolved three times in the water of the sea, once in the water of a cascading torrent, and again was expelled. It travelled with the wind for eight years, now high, now low, on the sea and among the clouds, over forests, deserts and limitless expanses of ice. Then it stumbled into capture and the organic adventure. Carbon, in fact, is a singular element. It is the only element that can bind itself in long, stable chains without great expense of energy. And for life on Earth, the only one we know so far, precisely long chains are required. Therefore, carbon is the key element of living substance. But its promotion, its entry into the living world, is not easy and must follow an obligatory intricate path which has been clarified, and not yet definitively, only in recent years. If the elaboration of carbon were not a common daily occurrence, on the scale of billions of tons a week, wherever the green of a leaf appears, it would by full right deserve to be called a miracle. The atom we are speaking of, accompanied by its two satellites, which maintain it in a gaseous state, was therefore borne by the wind along a row of vines in the year 1848. It had the good fortune to brush against a leaf, penetrate it, and be nailed there by a ray of the sun. Our atom of carbon enters the leaf, colliding with other innumerable but here useless molecules of nitrogen and oxygen. It adheres to a large and complicated molecule that activates it and simultaneously receives the decisive message from the sky in the flashing form of a packet of solar light. In an instant, like an insect caught by a spider, it is separated from its oxygen, combined with hydrogen and, one thinks, phosphorus, and finally inserted in a chain. Whether long or short, it does not matter, but it is the chain of life. All this happens swiftly, in silence, at the temperature and pressure of the atmosphere, and gratis, dear colleagues. When we learn to do likewise, we will be sick at deus, like God, and we will have solved the problem of hunger in the world. Now our atom is inserted. It is part of a structure, in an architectural sense. It has become related and tied to five companions so identical with it that only the fiction of the story permits me to distinguish them. It is a beautiful ring-shaped structure, an almost regular hexagon, which, however, is subjected to complicated exchanges and balances with the water in which it is dissolved, because by now it is dissolved in water, indeed the sap of the vine, and this, to remain dissolved, is both the obligation and the privilege of all substances 
that are destined to change. It has entered to form part of a molecule of glucose, just to speak plainly, a fate that is neither fish, flesh, nor fowl, which is intermediary, which prepares it for its first contact with the animal world, but does not authorize it to take on higher responsibility, that of becoming part of a proteic edifice. Hence it travels at the slow pace of vegetal juices, from the leaf, through the shoot to the trunk, and from here descends to the almost ripe bunch of grapes. What then follows is the province of the winemakers. We are only interested in pinpointing the fact that it escaped, to our advantage, since we would not know how to put it in words, the alcoholic fermentation, and reach the wine without changing its nature. It is the destiny of wine to be drunk, and it is the destiny of glucose to be oxidized. But it was not oxidized immediately. Its drinker kept it in his liver for more than a week, well curled up and tranquil, as a reserve aliment for a sudden effort, an effort that he was forced to make the following Sunday, pursuing a bolting horse. Farewell to the hexagonal structure. In the space of a few instants, the skein was unwound and became glucose again, and this was dragged by the bloodstream all the way to a minute muscle fiber in the thigh, and here brutally split into two molecules of lactic acid, the grim harbinger of fatigue, only later, some minutes after the panting of the lungs was able to supply the oxygen necessary to quietly oxidize the latter. So a new molecule of carbon dioxide returned to the atmosphere, and a parcel of energy that the sun had handed to the vine shoot passed from the state of chemical energy to that of mechanical energy, and thereafter settled down in the slothful condition of heat, warming up imperceptibly the air moved by the running and the blood of the runner. Such is life, although rarely is it described in this manner, and inserting itself, a drawing off to its advantage, a parasitizing of the downward course of energy from its noble solar form to the degraded one of low temperature heat. In this downward course, which leads to equilibrium and thus death, life draws a bend and nests in it. Our atom is again carbon dioxide, for which we apologize. This too is an obligatory passage one can imagine and invent others, but on earth, that's the way it is. Once again, the wind, which this time travels far, sails over the Apennines and the Adriatic, Greece, the Aegean and Cyprus. We are over Lebanon, and the dance is repeated. The atom we are concerned with is now trapped in a structure that promises to last a long time. It is the venerable trunk of a cedar, one of the last. It is passed again through the stages we have already described. And the glucose, of which it is part, belongs, like the bead of a rosary, to a long chain of cellulose. It is our whim to abandon it for a year, or five hundred years. Let us say that after twenty years, we are in 1868, a woodworm has taken an interest in it. It has dug its tunnel between the trunk and the bark, with the obstinate and blind veracity of its race. As it drills, it grows, and its tunnel grows with it. There it has swallowed and provided a setting for the subject of this story. Then it has formed a pupa, and in the spring it has come out in the shape of an ugly grey moth, which is now drying in the sun, confused and dazzled by the splendour of the day. Our atom is in one of the insect's thousand eyes, contributing to the summary and crude vision with which it orientates itself in space. The insect is fecundated, lays its eggs and dies. The small cadaver lies in the undergrowth of the woods. It is emptied of its fluids. But the chitin carapace resists for a long time, almost indestructible. The snow and sun return above it without injuring it. It is buried by the dead leaves and the loam. It has become a slough, a thing. But the death of atoms, unlike ours, is never irrevocable. Here at work the omnipresent, untiring and invisible grave diggers of the undergrowth the microorganisms of the humus. The carapace, with its eyes by now blind, has slowly disintegrated, and the ex-drinker, ex-cedar, ex-woodworm has once again taken wing. We will let it fly three times around the world, until 1960, and in justification of so long an interval in respect to the human measure, we will point out that it is, however, much shorter than the average, which we understand is 200 years. Every 200 years, every atom of carbon that is not congealed in materials by now stable 
such as precisely limestone or coal or diamond or certain plastics, enters and re-enters the cycle of life through the narrow door of photosynthesis. Do other doors exist? Yes, some synthesis created by man. They are the title of nobility for man the maker. But until now, their quantitative importance is negligible. They are doors still much narrower than that of the vegetable greenery. Knowingly or not, man has not tried until now to compete with nature on this terrain. That is, he has not striven to draw from the carbon dioxide in the air the carbon that is necessary to nourish him, clothe him, warm him, and for the hundred other more sophisticated needs of modern life. He has not done it because he has not needed to. He has found, and is still finding, but for how many more decades, gigantic reserves of carbon already organized, or at least reduced. Besides the vegetable and animal worlds, these reserves are constituted by deposits of coal and petroleum. But these too are the inheritance of photosynthetic activity carried out in distant epochs, so that one can well affirm that photosynthesis is not only the sole path by which carbon becomes living matter, but also the sole path by which the sun's energy becomes chemically usable. I could tell innumerable other stories, and they would all be true, all literally true, in the nature of the transitions, in their order and data. The number of atoms is so great that one could always be found whose story coincides with any capriciously invented story. I could recount an endless number of stories about carbon atoms that become colors or perfumes in flowers, of others which, from tiny algae to small crustaceans to fish, gradually return as carbon dioxide to the waters of the sea in a perpetual, frightening round dance of life and death in which every devourer is immediately devoured, or those to which fell the privilege of forming part of a grain of pollen and left their fossil imprint in the rocks for our curiosity, of others still that ended to become part of the mysterious shape messengers of the human seed, and participated in the subtle process of division, duplication and fusion from which each of us is born. Instead, I will tell just one more story, the most secret, and I will tell it with the humility and restraint of him who knows from the start that his theme is desperate, his means feeble, and the trade of clothing facts in words is bound by its very nature to fail. It is again among us, in a glass of milk, it is inserted in a very complex long chain, yet such that almost all of its links are acceptable to the human body. It is swallowed, and since every living structure harbors a savage distrust towards every contribution of any material of living origin, the chain is meticulously broken apart, and the fragments, one by one, are accepted or rejected. One, the one that concerns us, crosses the intestinal threshold and enters the bloodstream. It migrates, knocks at the door of a nerve cell, enters and supplants the carbon which was part of it. This cell belongs to a brain, and it is my brain, the brain of the me who is writing, and the cell in question, and within it the atom in question, is in charge of my writing. In a gigantic minuscule game which nobody has yet described, it is that which at this instant issuing out of a labyrinthine tangle of yeses and noes, makes my hand run along a certain path on the paper. Mark it with these volutes that are signs, a double snap, up and down, between two levels of energy, guides this hand of mine to impress on the paper this dot, here, this one. Gerard McDermott was reading the story of a carbon atom by Primo Levi. The producer is Louise Grealish.